From the Ear to There Travel Studio, this is the Ear to There Disney Podcast. The Ear to There Podcast, it's time to start the show. Be sure to hold on tight, here we go. Exploring all the different Disney destinations. Ear to There, it's time to start the fun. Hello everybody and welcome to the Ear to There Podcast, Walt Disney World. Word of the week. I'm your host, Phil Gramlich, and each and every week I will bring you a different Walt Disney World word and then give you all kinds of background, history, tips, hints, tricks, you know, all kinds of stuff about that word. So let's get right into it. This week's Walt Disney World word of the week is brought to you by the letter K. K for Kimball. And I'm not talking about Richard Kimball, who Harrison Ford played in The Fugitive, remember, I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. That was Tommy Lee Jones on the response there, <laughs> if you couldn't tell from my impression. Anyway, no, this week I wanted to talk about Disney legend and one of Walt Disney's nine old men, Ward Kimball. And if at the start of the show you're saying to yourself, I don't really know who Ward Kimball is. Trust me, in a couple of minutes, you'll find out that you are very, very familiar with a ton of his work. So Ward Kimball was born on March 4th, 1914 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now we're going to take a time warp all the way until he attended the Santa Barbara School of Arts in order to become a painter and an illustrator. I know I jumped ahead of his whole childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, but for the sake of time, <laughs> I tried to fit these in in 15 or 20 minutes, so just go with me on that one. All right. So he went to the Santa Barbara School of Arts in order to become a painter and an illustrator, and one of his instructors at the school suggested that he turn his work in and apply for a job at Walt Disney Productions, which would later be known as the Walt Disney Animation Studios. So in... March of 1934, he applied for a job at the Disney studio. In April, he was hired as an in-betweener. Now, if you don't know what an in-betweener is, because I sure as heck didn't before I had Rolly Crump on the show, and Rolly was on episode 11 and explained that an in-betweener is basically the guy who draws up the scenes between two key scenes in animation. So they are basically in charge of making the movements of the characters seem as fluid as possible. So after a while, he was then promoted to assistant animator, where he worked on the Silly Symphony series. Ward also had a chance to work on some of the Mickey Mouse cartoons, including the 1934 Mickey Mouse short Orphan's Benefit. And if you've seen Orphan's Benefit, let me know, because I definitely have not. Okay, moving on. In 1936, he was promoted to a full-time animator, and he eventually went on to be one of the main animators for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was released in 1937. Of course, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the first ever full-length animated feature, and Ward actually spent months on the scene where the dwarfs were eating soup that was cre created, that's not the right word, <laughs> that was prepared by Snow White. So, of course, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs went on to be a tremendous success. So, after that was released and after all of the accolades that it received, Ward Kimball was promoted to a supervising animator where he would stay in that position until he retired in the 1970s. Now, it was in that position of supervising animator when Ward Kimball was tasked with designing a new character for Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket. So now you're starting to see where and what makes this guy totally iconic, right? So he was in charge of animated at Seven Dwarfs, and now he comes on to create the look of Jiminy Cricket, another truly iconic character in Disney history. After he was finished with Jiminy Cricket, he then went on to design the Crows for Dumbo in 1941. And like the Seven Dwarfs, they all had their own distinct personalities and features. The Crows in Dumbo were given their own distinct appearances and characters by Ward Kimball. 
Then in the years that followed, Ward went on to be the animation director for several Disney animated films like Fantasia, The Reluctant Dragon, The Three Caballeros. He directed the character animation and sequences for the Pecos Bill segment in Melody Time in 1948. He was the senior animator for The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad in 1949. For Cinderella that came out in 1950, he was responsible for the characters of Jack, Gus, and Lucifer the Cat. In Alice in Wonderland in 1951, talk about busy, right? Holy cow. He was responsible for Tweedledee, Tweedledum, the walrus, and the carpenter, and the Mad Hatter, and his Mad Tea Party, and the Cheshire Cat. He also worked on Peter Pan in 1953, Mary Poppins in 1964, and Bed Knobs and Broomsticks in 1971. Now, that doesn't cover his whole career, but, I, you know, again, I had to fit this into like 10, 15 minutes, so <laughs> that's a lot of his career. But what Ward Kimball may be most known for isn't his work, it isn't his animation, it isn't his Academy Awards, but it may be his Backyard Railroad. So in 1938, yep, we're going back in time again, Ward Kimball purchased a passenger coach which was built in 1881 by the Barney and Smith Car Company. Now, his original intention of buying this passenger coach was to house his collection of model trains in his home in California. But it was his wife, Betty Kimball, who suggested that he also buy a locomotive to help pull the coach around the backyard. Okay, so a quick aside, right? This guy, Ward Kimball, in 1938 had just come off the biggest success in his life, okay? He was one of the nine old men. He was one of the animators on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He was 24 years old at this point, and his wife, who apparently was a saint, said, not only can you buy the passenger car and put it in our backyard, why don't you buy a locomotive too? <laughs> a full-size locomotive that can tug the passenger car around the backyard. It's cool with me. Anyway, I, I think I would have a problem trying to convince my wife to let me buy a backyard railroad, but apparently Betty was all for it, so good for her and good for Ward. Anyway, back to the story. So he did end up buying a locomotive for $400, great deal, by the way, from the Nevada Central Railroad, and they were selling it for scrap. The locomotive was named as Sidney Dillon, and it was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1881. So Ward Kimball renamed the locomotive the Emma Nevada, which was named after a famous opera star in the late 1800s. And over the next several years, he and his family and his friends worked on restoring the Emma Nevada into operating condition. Eventually, Ward's Backyard Railroad opened and became operational in 1942. He named the Backyard Railroad the Grizzly Flats Railroad, and it eventually consisted of 900 feet of narrow-gauge track, including a 500-foot main line in its backyard. The Grizzly Flats Railroad was the first full-size backyard railroad in the United States. Now, in the next few years, Ward added a boxcar, a cattle car, a caboose, and even a second locomotive to the Grizzly Flats Railroad. He eventually also added several different structures to the railroad as well, including a roundhouse, a water tower, a windmill, and a depot building. And the depot building was given to him as a gift by none other than Walt Disney himself. That depot building was originally used as a set piece for the 1949 film, So Dear to My Heart. So like I said, he got, that, he got the depot building from Walt Disney. Now, in 1945, Walt Disney attended one of Ward Kimball's steam-ups. Now, if you don't know what a steam-up is, don't worry, because I didn't either until I read about it. Basically, it was just a party at the Kimball's house where the Grizzly Flats Railroad was in operation. Now, during that party, Walt Disney was given the opportunity to drive the Emma Nevada locomotive. And this was the first time that he had been in the cab of a locomotive since he was a teenager working on the Missouri Pacific Railway. So I don't know if it was that afternoon or that evening, but because of that ride and because of that party, Walt decided to build his own 
of course, much smaller backyard railroad, which he named the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, in the backyard of his Carrollwood Drive home in Los Angeles. Then, of course, all of the people who would come to see Walt's Backyard Railroad eventually inspired him to put a railroad around his dream project, his theme park, Disneyland. What's really cool is the Disneyland Railroad's Frontierland Station Depot was built using the same blueprints from the Grizzly Flats Railroad's Depot building. And that still, obviously, that still stands today. In 1992, Ward Kimball began to donate his Grizzly Flat Railroad rolling stock to the Orange Empire Railway Museum in Paris, California. One of the last pieces that was donated was the second locomotive named Chloe after one of Ward Kimball's daughters. Ward Kimball passed away in 2002 in Los Angeles at the age of 88. To honor Ward Kimball, in 2005, the Disneyland Railroad named its newly acquired engine number five, the Ward Kimball. Now, normally that's where this story would end, but actually, Ward Kimball's legacy lives on to this day. After his trains were donated to the museum, Pixar film director and basically living Disney legend John Lasseter acquired the Grizzly Flats Railroad Depot building and the water tower and moved them to his private Justy Creek Railway. So yes, John Lasseter is continuing on the tradition of Walt Disney and Ward Kimball and another Disney legend and backyard railroad enthusiast, Ollie Johnston, and he has his own backyard railroad as well. He actually also acquired the Marie E., which operates on his Justy Creek Railroad. And that engine was actually once owned by Ollie Johnston. Okay, so you ready for this? This is where everyone in this story, in Ward Kimball's story, in Walt's story, kind of ties together, right? So the Rivers of America in Disneyland were closed last year to make way for the construction of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Now, the railroad had to be shut down as well, and it had to be altered, and Frontierland was made a bit smaller. So on July 28th, 2017, the Disneyland Railroad and the Rivers of America were reopened. But they weren't reopened with one of the Disneyland Railroad engines taking the first lap. No, actually, it was the historic Marie E., again, that, that is now owned by John Lasseter, but was once owned by Ollie Johnston. And coupled behind it was the Chloe that was once owned by Ward Kimball. What's really cool is John Lasseter was able to bring these historic engines to Disneyland, and he actually drove them around the park for the reopening of the Disneyland Railroad. So John Lasseter fully understands the importance of Ward Kimball and Ollie Johnston and their influence on Walt Disney to have his own backyard railroad that eventually led to the Disneyland Railroad that now circles the park. As a matter of fact, Ward Kimball and Ollie Johnston were responsible for all of the railroads in all of the Magic Kingdom-style parks around the world. And that is going to do it for this week's Ear to There podcast, Walt Disney World Word of the Week. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I really, really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This was a fun one. I like taking a look back at the Disney legends and animators. And really, Ward Kimball was so influential and had so much to do with the early Disney animation and with Disneyland itself. And he had such an influence on Walt Disney. So it was really cool and really fun to go back and look at a bit of Disney history and Mr. Ward Kimball. So again, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it again. And if you did enjoy it, please just tell someone about the show. I'd really appreciate that. I'm sure you know someone in your life who loves to hear the history of Disney, the history of Disneyland, Walt's backstory, Walt's history. So please share this episode with them. I'd really appreciate it. And Thank you in advance, and you are awesome. All right, so there will be a new episode of the Ear to There podcast, Walt Disney World Word of the Week, each and every Wednesday morning. 
Uh, there will also be a regular episode of the Ear to There podcast out each and every Monday morning. And also look for my other show, Running for Sandwiches. That will be each and every Tuesday morning. So thank you again so much for listening. Until next time, have a simply phenomenal week. Bye-bye.